Okay, well, um, I know that was a little short break, but I hope everybody's back online so we can continue with our second presentation for this afternoon. Uh, we have upcoming a power of peer mentoring, a mentor and mentee perspective. Next slide. So our speaker is Danielle Andrews. She is a public health social worker that has worked for the IPRO ESRD network for over three years. Her work focuses primarily on health equity, behavioral modification, patient advocacy, patient education, and mental health. She received her Master's of Social Work from Fordham University and Master of Public Health from University of Albany School of Public Health. So we're well, uh, welcome, Danielle, and um, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for having me. Just want to make sure that you can hear me clearly. Yes, we can hear you, Danielle. Good. Next slide. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the power of peer mentoring. Next slide. So before we get started, I want to talk to you a little bit about the IPRO ESRD network. So we have over four different networks. Network one covers New England. Network two is New York. Network six is the South Atlantic. That's North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And network nine is the Ohio River Valley, which is Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. The mission of the IPRO end-stage renal disease network program is to promote healthcare for all ESRD patients that is safe, efficient, effective, patient-centered, timely, and equitable. Next slide. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about peer mentoring. Next slide. So what is peer mentoring? Peer mentoring is a relationship that benefits all parties, both mentor and mentee. Peer mentoring usually occurs to help an individual that is less experienced achieve a goal, reach a higher level of understanding, or develop effective coping skills under the guidance of a more experienced individual. Peer mentoring looks to build a supportive and safe relationship between two people through the sharing of knowledge and experiences while demonstrating differences to help each person grow. Peer mentoring can help in the development of problem solving skills, promote goal attainment, improve treatment compliance, and increase a patient's overall quality of life. Peer mentoring can be done in a one-to-one -one setting or a group setting. Next slide. How does peer mentoring work? What is a peer mentor? So a peer mentor is a trained individual from any background or ethnicity that shares his or her experiences with kidney disease to help his or her peers feel less alone in facing the challenges of ESRD. Peer mentors can help motivate a peer to stay active in his or her health care. So who is a peer mentee? A peer mentee is a person who is looking to make a connection with a peer who is thriving despite having kidney disease and wants to know more about their ESRD and wants to know how this person is thriving with their diagnosis. So during a peer mentoring session, there should be a mutual exchange between the mentor and mentee even though the mentee has less experience with ESRD. The sharing of experiences and different perspectives should help build a strong bond and promote an environment of co-learning. So the mentee should be learning from the mentor because they have a longer experience in ESRD, but because they both bring different perspectives, it should create an environment of co-learning because the mentor should also be learning from the mentee. Next slide. <coughs> the role of a peer mentor. So a peer mentor should improve communications among patients, caregivers, providers, and other individuals within the ESRD community. They should provide support to patients and mentees through information sharing, listening to concerns, and sharing experiences. They should act as a role model through demonstration of positive behaviors during difficult and complex situations. They should also offer mentees encouragement as they encounter new situations and challenges within their treatment. They also help relieve anxiety and promote positive behavioral changes. And they also kind of provide support and increase the confidence of new patients, especially those that have crashed into dialysis or individuals that didn't have CKD prior. Next slide. So who should be an ESRD peer mentor? 
ESRD peer mentors can range from all different backgrounds, races, and ethnicities. In some cases, they can speak multiple languages but should be proficient in English. Peer mentors should be individuals who generally have a positive attitude and outlook on being an active member of their healthcare team and managing their ESRD treatment plan. They should have also been in the ESRD treatment modality for at least a year. So that's going to be in center, peritoneal, home hemo, or transplantation. They should also have strong conversational skills and have the ability to connect and communicate with their ESRD peers. These individuals should be successful in their own ESRD treatment goals and can provide insight to help others improve their ESRD treatment management skills. Next slide. So there are quite a few benefits of peer mentoring. So it can increase self-esteem and confidence among patients, enhance communication understanding between staff and patients, and can improve patient knowledge and empower patients to be more self-advocate or just to be more involved and be more active. It can improve patients' knowledge and it can increase socialization with one another and enhance their overall ESRD experience. It can also improve the facilities and patients' outcomes because it can help tackle barriers that may inhibit someone from being compliant with their treatment. It can really help social workers and the staff really understand the barriers that are inhibiting a patient from being compliant. It can improve home dialysis and transplant referrals, and it can pique a patient's interest in other treatment modalities as well as it can improve a new, a new patient's adjustment to the facility and the demands of treatment. Next slide. So how we created the IPRO peer mentoring program. Next slide. So we do our peer mentoring program through IPRO Learn, which is our one-stop shop for everything ESRD related. IPRO Learn is an online learning platform that provides facilities, patients, and caregivers a centralized place for all ESRD network related projects, information, and best practice strategies. iProLearn is an online place created to help empower patients to work collaboratively with their facilities to improve their quality of care and overall quality of life. Next slide. So through iProLearn, you can access our peer mentoring program. We have five different modules. So the first module is talking effectively with another patient. This provides basic tips and guidance to help an individual talk and listen to other patients as an effective peer mentor. The second one is mentoring to support choices, which focuses on your role as a peer mentor and the importance of helping patients learn more about health choices that may be available to them. Our third module focuses on discussing home dialysis as a treatment option. So it really trains peer mentors on how to support mentees on learning about home dialysis treatment options, and steps to take to pursue evaluation to receive treatment at home. Fourth module is discussing transplant as an option. And this trains peer mentors on how to share information with their mentees about transplant as a treatment option and steps to take to pursue evaluation for a kidney transplant. And then our last module is discussing vac vascular access planning. This trains peer mentors on how to share information with their mentees about the benefits of a fish flow or a graph and how to create a vascular access plan for a permanent access type. Next slide. So this is just a view of our IPRO Learn. So here, this is a peer mentoring training and you can see our courses. So the first one is mandatory, the second one is mandatory. And then if you look at the sidebar, we also have a section for our patient facility representative alliance. So next slide. So this was kind of our recruitment process. Next slide. So we really focused on incorporating our patient facility representatives into our peer mentoring program. So just as a brief overview, our patient facility representative alliance or PFR alliance is a patient advocacy group that provides patients, transplant recipients and care partners the opportunity to share thoughts and experiences on ESRD care, as well as develop different strategies on how to get more ESRD patients to become active within their healthcare. The PFR Alliance also seeks to promote positive relationships between patients, provider staff, ESRD stakeholders, and the network. So if we were recruiting 
PFRs to be a part of the peer mentoring program. We wanted to know how much peer mentoring experience each individual had, how long each member had been in ESRD treatment, if they were previously certified as peer mentors, and how long had it been since they were previously certified, would they be in need of a peer mentoring refresher course, did they have a background in patient advocacy, how well were these individuals collaborating with their facility staff, if they were compliant in their treatment, and then how much each individual person knew and, understa and understood about ESRD. Next slide. We also worked with facilities because we wanted facilities to start identifying patients that had leadership ability. So there were patients that who didn't really know about IPRO, but they were operating in a patient advocate manner. So we really wanted to get these patients into our program. So they started with an orientation. We helped them become more activated within their healthcare team. We started with education. So we have monthly meetings where we talk about different educations and we really taught them about ESRD treatment options because our biggest goal is to make sure that they understood it and that they could then exp explain it to their ESRD peers. And then we had them engaging with other patients within their facility. So that was kind of sharing like our education, our resources, and our presentation. And once they were comfortable within that role, we then had them complete the peer mentoring training. Next slide. So here are some of the resources that we have. So one of them, so a lot of our resources focus on fostering positive conversations. So we want, again, as a peer mentor, you want to make sure you have a positive outlook. You're saying the conversation and positivity, even if the patient is negative and is expressing negative thoughts. You want to highlight the strengths in that patient. We also focused on relationship building because peer mentoring is only as strong as the bond the mentor and the mentee has with each other. And then you want to foster an environment of co-learning. So you want to make sure that your bond is big enough that each of you are learning with each session. We also wanted to make sure people were able to identify a mentee's strength. So when you're having these sessions, it's always good to validate the mentee and let them know that they're doing well and what they're doing well and what they should continue doing. As well as develop problem solving skills because one of the reasons mentees are looking for mentors is because they're having complex issues or they're struggling within their healthcare. And you want to give them the tools that they need to continue to persevere within their treatment. Then we just have education, which is information sharing, and then virtual engagement. And the virtual engagement played a big part because of COVID person-to-person -person interaction wasn't necessarily allowed within the facility. So virtual engagement allowed peer mentors and mentees to engage with each other on a face-to-face on a -face interface. So that was probably FaceTime, WebEx, Zoom, and in some cases phone, but she wanted to make sure there was still this face-to-face -face contact. Next slide. So then also, we wanted to make sure we stayed connected with all of our patients. So we did monthly messaging. We sent out text messages. We talked about um, what peer mentoring was, um, how it was beneficial, how they can become peer mentors, and why they should become peer mentors. And we also talked about the skills necessary to become a peer mentor. This went out to the patients every single month, especially in our um, PFR newsletter. Next slide. And then again, I spoke previously about our monthly meetings. So we have a lot of monthly meetings where we talk with our PFRs and we really try to improve or increase their level of ESRD education, as well as understand the overarching issues within the ESRD community, because then we can kind of provide them with education or even create resources for some of the barriers that they're encountering within their facility. And then we sought to highlight the different ESRD topics each individual peer mentor or patient was interested in. And this way they can take these topics back to their mentor-mentee interactions. And then we also had our network patient assistance where we just help patients navigate the iProneLearn website where it can be a little bit complicated and we wanna make sure that we provided technical assistance for them. 
Next slide. So now I want to open up for a peer mentoring panel discussion. Next slide. So I have four of my very active PFR from our PFR Alliance members. They all represent each different network within our IPRO ESRD program. So first I have Kenneth Teasley. Ken Teasley is a long-term patient subject matter expert and a member of the Medical Review Board at the IPRO ESRD Network 2, where he is a strong transplant advocate. He has collaborated with numerous organizations, such as the American Association of Kidney Patients, the National Kidney Foundation, Transplant Recipients International Organization Support Group, Live on New York, and the Community Advisory Board at his clinic, Mount Sinai. He is a long-term peer mentor and has participated in numerous peer mentoring programs. Currently, he engages in the ESRD, NCC, COVID-19, and vaccination infinity groups. So I would like to welcome Ken. Next slide. I would also like to welcome Kim Pratt. Kim Pratt is a long-term patient subject matter expert for the IPRO ESRD network and is a strong transplant advocate. She is also a long-term PFR and has participated in numerous peer mentoring programs. Kim is currently working with the ESRD and CC Affinity Group on the Transplant po Podcast. Kim is also an active member of Network One's Medical Review Board. So I would like to welcome Kim Pratt. And then we have Rhonda Diaz. Rhonda is a long-term patient subject matter expert for the IPRO ESRD Network, that's Network 6 and is a strong transplant advocate. She is a peer mentor for both the IPRO ESRD Network and the American Association for kidney, of Kidney Patients. She is also a part of the ESRD NCC Transplant Affinity Group. Next slide, and I would like to welcome Rhonda. And then lastly, we have Naisha Neal. Naisha is a long-term patient subject matter expert from the IPRO ESRD Network and a transplant recipient from Network 9. She has been an active member of our patient network team and has collaborated with us on numerous resource development projects and is a strong proponent for transplant education. And I would like to welcome Naisha. So are all of you guys on? And have you guys unmuted yourselves? Yes. 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 Okay. Hello. So welcome, you guys. I'm going to start with Ken. So I'm going to ask you, do you see the value in a peer mentoring program? Oh, it's a big value in the peer mentoring program. Um, I just take from one of my experiences. Um, in 2002, um, I found a website and one of the things it told me to do was for pre-dialysis was to find a peer. And so I went to my doctor and I was looking for a peer and I asked him, for one and he's like well you know there's this hipaa thing out there and uh, we can't do that right now um so that was one of the reasons why i actually became up here myself um because i needed somebody to walk me through the whole dialysis process i mean i had i had seen it <clears throat> because my aunt was on dialysis but we had never talked about what actually happens on the dialysis process so i I think a, a peer can help someone uh, find out what, what that's like, uh, especially, especially now when we're talking about transplants. Um, this is my actually my second time on transplant list, and I, each time has been different. So each time I have different things to tell people as far as, you know, what they can do and who they need to speak to. Well, thank you, Ken. I'm going to pose the same question to you, Kim. Hi. Um, do I see the value in peer mentoring? Absolutely. I wish I had a peer mentor and I had to become my own peer mentor in a way. Um, one of the groups uh, of patients that reach out to me more than I expected uh, being a peer mentor are the CKD patients told that they need a transplant, but they haven't started dialysis yet. They're usually overwhelmed and have tons of questions, and they are thankful to get the perspective of an experienced patient. They want to see proof 
that a person can go through this journey and have a chance at a form of normalcy, I guess, quote, quote unquote, uh, after a transplant. <clears throat> Some people imagine the worst case scenarios. Um, and, you know, just a calm voice of hope offering education and solutions to get them through the process can be worth more than gold. And I know that from being in my own shoes, I know what it was like. I was faced with many different obstacles along the way, and I hate to see people feeling overwhelmed. I recognize those signs um, when they have questions. And so I am experienced in that. So I, I'm able to uh, say, truthfully, I know how you feel. I know, I know what that feels like to be in that place. So I do understand completely uh, the value of the peer mentoring program. Thank you, Kim. I'm going to ask you, Rhonda, the same question. Do you see the value in, peer ment in a peer mentoring program? Most definitely. So, you know, we all have our stories. But for me, you know, I had a mother, a sister, and two very close cousins all on dialysis. So I want, went into that center thinking I was uh, so knowledgeable. I thought I was the, the most informed person that, that comes around <laughs> when it came to dialysis. And then I walked in and realized I didn't know a damn thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I needed somebody to, to go to and there was no one, you know? So I started learning and, and then I started talking to other patients and I found those who had been there for a long time and realized what they didn't, what what they weren't informed about or what they didn't know and it just it spun from there it, it that's what piqued my interest in doing this was here i was thinking i was most miss know-it-all and i didn't know anything and then people who had been there for years and seeing their lack of knowledge and understanding and advocacy and you know it was just some place they went every day you know or three times a week so did I see, do I see the value? Most definitely. It, it's just, it's something that I wish we could get out in front. Like, you know, Kim says she sees people coming to her who aren't, aren't there yet. I wish there was a way we could get up out in front of it because it's so valuable. Thank you, Rhonda. So now I also want to pose this question to Naisha. Do you see the value in a peer mentoring program? Yeah, um, there is great value in um, peer mentoring, um, more so because, like everyone has said, just like the unknown at the beginning, um, really not having that support that uh, you need to have someone who's also going through the same thing that you're going through. I was just talking to my husband about this last night. It's one thing when you have the support of your village and your community. That's awesome. But it's a it's a different type of support when you have the support of those actually walking in your shoes. They can really empathize with what you're, you know, what you're going through. Oh, thank you so much. Well, to just hop off of that question, why did you choose to become a peer mentor? I myself? Yes. Oh, um, I chose to become a peer mentor because there just isn't enough um, education and advocacy for Black and African American people, at least in my state. I can't speak on the other states, but at least in my state. And I felt that by being a peer mentor, I would be able to educate those that may be shy with asking questions, be able to be a voice for them. One thing that I am big on, um, and I actually didn't realize this until dealing with uh, kidney failure and doing um, dialysis, is that I am big on being a voice for the voiceless. So as I'm sitting around and you know we are doing our sessions and I'm listening to what people are saying and if I offer them to say, you know, why don't you talk to the social worker? Well, you know, I just, they're not gonna listen to me. 
we're going to make them listen to you. And so when I started noticing that a lot of um, more so the, the black and African-American um, patients just weren't getting their voices heard, their needs met, I started looking into, you know, how can this be perfected? How can I step in and help out? And that's how I was able to uh, find more about where I could fit in and, and do that by peer mentoring. I would also just like to say that these four people that are on this call, they do help the network in identifying areas that we may not have originally identified as barriers. I can speak for especially Naisha, Rhonda, Kim, and Ken. They brought to our attention um, issues that they were having as for transplant, and they were able to pick up that their transplants were having small rejections because they were so educated on their ESRE treatment that they were able to help us actually create resources that help these particular patients who wouldn't know how to identify these symptoms. Okay, so I'm going to pose this question to you, Ken. Why did you choose to become a peer mentor? You know, as I said before, I was asking for one. I asked my doctor for one. And, um, but um, I guess in the general sense, um, I became a peer many moons ago, even before I found out about my kidney disease. Um, I was originally diagnosed with HIV in 1993. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm by my hospital in the middle of Central Park. And <laughs> there's a siren in the middle of the traffic. Um, but I needed to, I thought I had two years to live. So I needed to know as much information as I could. And I needed to find out where I could get it from. Um, most of my friends were dying, so I needed to help them. Um, so getting involved in the different organizations that I've been in in the last 20 or so years, um, you know, it, it was a needed, needed thing. And then once I got in the door, it became part of my reality. Um, it, it, it was like a habit. It was like a second nature. Um, and then I just took it from there and I, you know, kind of increased everything. And, um, and then once I started dialysis, I just tried, I joined the network in order to try to uh, use those skills that I had developed over all those years. So that's why I became a peer mentor. Okay, thank you, Ken. I'm going to also pose the same question to you, Ken. Hi. Yes, I'm just going to go on for just a, a second here because I just want to set the feel of why. Um, I earned a bunch of kidney disease life stripes on my own. That's what I call it, life stripes. I know what I know what those needles felt like, the cramps, the post bleeds. The blood pressure dips, your bottom hurting from hours of sitting in the dialysis chair, infiltrated and clotted fistulas, going under the knife a few times just to qualify to be listed for a transplant, Closing, closely watching your labs and dry weight. I know what liquid cell tastes like. I don't like it, but I know. Uh, getting your blood pressure taken hundreds of times going 16 months without submerging your body in water because you have a chest catheter placed, praying you don't need to use the restroom after you're hooked up to the machine, watching your fellow patients die, and wondering if you are next. I want to be the peer mentor that I didn't have. And that's why I'm a peer mentor. I am passionate about it. I, I don't even think about it. It's, it's just what... I feel I need to do. It's like breathing. If that makes sense. It makes sense. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And don't forget the hemorrhoids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Even more. There's more gems. Now I'm going to post, post the same question to you, Rhonda. So Kim captured a lot of it. But for me, you know, I spent time mentoring kids. I've... Uh, mentored people, you know, from a financial perspective. And 
I always ask, you know, faith is very important to me. And I always ask God, what's my next passion? And it was, your family has been hit with this, this, this disease. You've been impacted with it. And you're looking at a bunch of people faced with the same thing. Why don't you start something to, um, that's close to home? And it, it just began as a small group of women going out to lunch and it spiraled from there. And that's how I became a peer mentor. So I, 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 I laughed as Kim was speaking because I think her and I must have had mirrored lives. You know? <laughs> so it, it's all of that. All right, guys. So the next question I wanted to ask, and thank you, Rhonda, for your answer, mm -hmm. um, is how has being a peer mentor or a patient advocate changed your interaction with your ESRD peers or just other ESRD patients in general? Um, do you want to take this one, Kim? Okay. Um, how, how has being a peer mentor or patient advocate changed your interaction with your ESRD peers? Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Well, um, one thing is, you know, they have many questions for me regarding my experiences. That That's a big one, is that they know you've experienced uh, so many different things that uh, they, they've got lots of questions, you know. Um, you know, I'm making myself visible as an example of a patient who's made it through many steps. You know, I endured, I endured to reach the place I am now. Uh, as a successful and happy transplanted patient. Um, you know, I'm a source of hope and support while offering solid kidney education, you know, so that that is, I would say, is people really having a lot more questions. I've, I've, um, I've had to get surgeries. I had to lose 190 pounds. I have gained some back, though. I'll be that person, too, to tell you that it's hard to keep all the weight off um, after the transplant, but I'm working on that. I know what it's like to, to go ahead and get gastric bypass surgery. There's a, there are patients that are wondering, should they do that in order to reach their BMI? Um, how did it feel to get it? You know, I get all the questions about even just that. Uh, then I needed another surgery to, to get skin removal and a, and a and a um, complicated hernia repair, which, you know, they told me, the doctor said, he typed in, he had an app on his phone, I think, that to see the the percentage of problems that I that could come from that surgery alone of, of two surgeons, one doing skin and one doing the hernia repair. I wasn't going to be able to get the transplant uh, with the skin. They said that it could pose infection and or the kidney can shift and um, he said there's, you know, at least a 40% chance that something will go wrong during this surgery. And, and I just, I look at it like I'm leaping. I just leap into fit. Like I, I just want a better life. And I, and I just say to myself, if, if it's, it's meant to be, it's meant to be, I'm going to get whatever I need to do. And I guess those different obstacles that I endured, um, that it creates questions. Other ESRD peers have questions about how I handled um, certain things and how, what I did to um, get through and how, what did it feel like a lot. They want to know, a lot of people want to ask a peer, what did it feel like rather than ask their doctor. Their doctor can give them a certain amount of information, um, but it's the peer that they want to know, what did it feel like? Because they know they can ask the peer that question. What? Well, how did it feel? You know, the doctor didn't have that surgery. So, well, some have, but typically not. So I'd say that's my answer. Thank you, Kim. I'm going to ask Naisha the same question. How has being a peer mentor slash patient advocate changed your interaction with your ESRD peers? Um. Actually, doing this um, has more so changed my interaction with peers in general. 
more so pre or nine uh, SRD people. The way I see this is, I went through this experience, and while going through this experience, I was able to advocate and be a voice for those around me. Now that I am still in this um, in this community, more so uh, on the, the the transplant end, my my voice now is to um, eliminate others from being in these shoes, from sitting four to six hours in those chairs, for spending their late nights hooked up to the PD machine, for the countless hours of education and training that they would have to go through just to even switch to a home modality. You know, I, I can't I can't bring um, as much attention as I want to just on um, the the disparities that's going on as it as it relates to different races. And with me having a better understanding of that, those are the 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 ones that I'm trying to reach out to the most. You know, when I'm in the community and I'm talking with those that aren't um, in our shoes. I'm reminding them, you know, Black and African Americans, we have higher chances of high blood pressure. We have higher chances of, of diabetes. Those are two things that can get you into this chair. What are we going to do to change that? So I've been able to um, take, take the, the peer mentoring and keep it still within the community, but take it out of the community to prevent more people from joining this community as as great as it is <laughs> yeah. I, I don't i don't want i don't want us to have any more friends <laughs> along the line you know what i'm saying i don't i don't want to see any anyone else having to fight you know for, for for myself five years on the transplant list with six freaking failed calls you know mm -hmm. all of that is taxing on the mind and the body and the soul I don't know how many times I just wanted to say, to hell with this, I, I give up. Only to be told from hundreds of people, oh, you're so strong, you're so strong. And I'm looking at myself like, I'm tired. I just done dialysis. My blood pressure dropped. I'm not strong. So I don't want anyone else to, uh, to have that be a part of their story. But if they do, I will be there for that peer mentoring instant, not instant, or I'm talking like I am in center, but you understand <laughs> what I'm saying. I agree with you. That was, that was great. Um, I also would like to pose the same question to Rhonda. So for me, for me, I think it's um, with my peers is to impress upon them the need to be proactive. If you have a question, voice it, you know, and um, don't just accept what you're dealing with. You know, if there's something that you don't like, that don't accept it. Um, question it, ask, ask questions, ask questions of the doctor, ask questions of the tech, ask to see the center's director, you know, so I think for me, that was the biggest thing was my relationship with them was to impress upon them to be much more proactive and also try to get rid of the negativity in terms of how you deal with the people who are giving you your treatment and question them. Don't just say, well, that's just how they're going to be, you know. So I was doing that. But what I found myself also changing was, you know, people don't like people always forcing things down their throat or always wanting to jump into their business. So I found that once I started talking to people, more people came to me for questions, um, asking me, what are your, what are your thoughts? You know, and I always have to preference everything with, I'm not a medical person, but I would go ask these questions or go dig here further. I even had, you know, um, people whose spouses actually talk to my spouse and they actually actually hang out now 
in terms of how were you at, at a caregiver and, and, and deal with having somebody with kidney disease? Because that's so important for their partners to know, you know, so the guys sit around on the grill and they, they talk about it. So my relationship with my peers has been enhanced, right? Because before I would just go in the office and that was, I mean, go in the office, go into dialysis and, you know, just sit tight. But once I decided to be a mentor, I noticed my interactions increased, but I allowed them to come to me quite a bit also. And I just always wanted to make sure everybody was educated and informed and also was concerned about their caregiver because, you know, our families are living this with us. So that's that was probably the biggest thing for me was um, just more interaction with my peers. And then I found myself talking more to people about considering being a donor. A lot of times there was people in my world that didn't know I had kidney disease, they didn't know, I, you know, cause I was still working for a few years. People didn't know that I had it. And then I found myself after becoming a mentor start talking to them about other things. So it became much more public knowledge. So that's where I'm at. Well, thank you, Rhonda. And then I wanna pose this question to you, Ken. How has being a peer mentor slash patient advocate changed your interaction with your USRD peers? Wow. Um, I've been a lot through a lot in the last 10 years. Um, when I first started with the network, um, I didn't really know, you know, what was going on the whole nine yards. I changed a lot, you know, from one shift to another, trying to figure out my rhythm first before I could help somebody else. You know, somebody told me that a long time ago, help yourself before you can help somebody else. Um, so, but once I found my footing, I was able to, say things and do things. Um, most of my advocacy is built around modeling behavior. Um, it's not about telling you, you can't do this and you can't say that. It's more about showing you, yes, you can do this. Um, and I kind of been doing that for a long time, but it's, you may know this, it's a part of uh, harm reduction. And, um, you know, that was one of the things I fell in love with my last job. You know, like Rhonda said, you know, she didn't talk about, you know, the kidney, de kidney disease a lot. And I didn't talk about mine either. Um, I didn't really start talking about it until I started dialysis and that was after I left my job. So um, I guess most of the, change that has been has been <laughs> is as people are seeing what's happening and you know what's what i'm doing they, they ask questions about you know oh, how do you get in touch with this and um who do i need to speak to about this and you know that kind of thing and uh for me that's kind of icing on the cake because for me, it only takes like one person, you know, to, you know, bring that tear to my eye, um, knowing that I've helped them in some way. So thank you for asking. Thank you, Ken. So we're getting to our last question and I do wanna leave at least five minutes for questions at the end. I'm going to have two of you answer this, um, whoever feels comfortable answering. How important of a role does education and advocacy play in the overall improvement of an individual's quality of life or quality of care? Any of you guys? Can you uh, pop that question up on the screen? I'm um, sure. Can we switch slides? Oh, well, I mean, yeah, some, like, I, it was on somebody's slide. Yeah, it, it is on the slide. There's definitely okay. there it is. number four. Oh, um, this part right here is crucial, <laughs> crucial, crucial. <laughs> With, uh, 
can we emphasize that with the font size of maybe 50? And I say <laughs> that because without the education, I hate to say it, but the patient's going to fail. Mm. With, with, without the advocacy, they will, they will struggle more so probably internally because they, they, they don't have uh, someone to, to, to vent to or to, to support them or to speak up for them or whatever that cause may be. And they'll be like um, this little mustard seed in a cloud of hundreds of people fighting for to live on dialysis and to to fight to be on the transplant list so that um that part is is very important just education in general is going to be important whether that's pre diagnosis or currently being diagnosed um you know going going piggybacking off of what um, was said earlier by Danielle how a lot of us were able to identify, you know, changes in our body, whether that was with transplant or currently dealing with dialysis based off of that education and us knowing our body. So to be able to get other patients who can learn their body, know what's going on, um, it, it can help uh, eliminate a lot of a lot of headache. You know, I was surprised my my um, social worker had told me when he mentioned that I to some people that I had received a, a a pancreas. A lot of people didn't know that they could get a pancreas being a diabetic and having kidney failure. So just simple education like that. I mean, that can even boost more people into wanting to become uh, transplanted. Thank you. Is there one more person who wants to kind of answer this question to add on to what Naisha stated? I'm just going to say a little thing is that each piece of education that you gather is like earning a feather. And you to get each little feather of knowledge because everything they're going to tell you is there's a purpose and 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 there is an and a reaction of if you don't do what they say. It, it's very important to listen. So each of these feathers, whether it's support, education, um, you you decide, you put it together, you sew it together, you glue it, whatever, and that makes you fly. And that's how I look at it. Each feather, put it together, and that's what makes you rise above. You know, you rise above like a phoenix, <laughs> but you need those pieces of education. Okay, thank you so much. So before we get into the question section, I just want to thank my four panelists um, for coming on and sharing this experience with me. I, you know, I always say your experience and your expertise is invaluable, and I just want to thank you for taking the time out and speaking with me and having this panel. So with You're that, um, are there any questions? Yeah, thank you, Danielle. Um, and also, I agree, your panelists, uh, Kim, Ken, Rhonda, and Nisha, thank you for all that great um, conversation and feedback. There is a couple comments and questions uh, that we can throw out to everybody. A couple comments was just from Joy, be the mentor you didn't have. I think that somebody mentioned that earlier. Kim, and it might have been what you, she's responding to. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then just to get a comment, I decided to become a mentor because of my parents and the lessons taught at home. African proverb, each one reach one, each one teach one. So thank you for sharing that too in the chat. Um, Tony says, when we come through, it's easier to bring others through. So agree, totally agree. agree. So great, these are really nice comments. Um, and um, Tony also says, speak up. So again, education is power, absolutely. Um, thank you all, it was a great session from Susan. Um, another, another from Tracy, prevention of ESRD is everything, but until the corner and grocery stores support a healthier diet, it's difficult, absolutely. 
Um, I do have a, a question. I think we have time to put it out. And again, it could be for anybody. Uh, what advice would you give someone who wants to talk to somebody about kidney disease, but maybe is a little hesitant? Anybody want to just respond to that or comment, even in, um, even Danielle or any of your our the peers on? Just do it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If you have to think about it, then maybe it's not the time. Right. But if you just do it, then you know it is the time. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, another question. Um, do people ever ask you for medical advice during your peer mentoring session? And if they do, uh, what happens when they ask for medical advice? Hmm. I'll just call on Rhonda. <laughs> so I was getting ready to chime in anyways. Okay, uh, great, thanks. The first thing you have to say is, you know, I don't have a medical degree. I can answer you about how I might have dealt with a situation, but you must talk to your doctor. You know, and I've had people ask me those type of questions. And it's, you know, I don't, you know, my degree's in computers. That's not going to help you. So go, go speak to your medical staff. Great. Absolutely. Thank you. How about Ken? Did you have it if you had that experience? Was that for me? Yeah. Have you had any oh, experience with baby patients asking about medical advice? How do you handle that? What did your doctor say? <laughs> and if you don't understand what he said, then you need to go back and talk to him again. I can tell you what, like uh, Rhonda just said, I can tell you what happened to me or what I did, but we're two different people. Mm -hmm. Right. And I see um, on social media, there are some sites. Uh, there's one I look at sometimes is, is uh, dialysis discussion uncensored. And there are people that very often will ask medical advice uh, that way. And they're always told, you know, go to your doctor first. People say it all the time. That's what that's what you got to do. Mm -hmm. So we don't know their medical background. We don't know that. We don't know anything. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I just a couple more comments here before we maybe to pause for a break. Um, just as a social worker has come from Michael, I thank you for helping our fellow patients. You are awesome. So that's for every the whole panel. No one should go through dialysis alone from Donald. Great, great. Um, uh, from Tracy, yes, speak to the medical staff. I'm asked because I'm a nurse, but I always tell them to speak with their doctor. So, again, good advice if they start asking about that. So, yeah, really. Um, and then again, uh, I'd say the best people to get medical advice is from your doctor, nurse, or dietitians. 